Uh, thank you so much, Katie. Uh, it's really good to be here this morning and see so many of your faces. Um, I am Vicki Tobias, and I'm part of the digital projects team at Recollection Wisconsin, and also a project advisor for building a digital readiness community of practice. Uh, I'm really excited to tell you a bit more about this project, uh, which inspired this summer's digital readiness fairs, and some of the key resources that we've already created as part of it to support your digital projects work. Uh, and you'll hear a little bit from uh, you'll hear from Kristen Whitson in just a moment, and she's going to tell you a little bit more about some of the resources, uh, the tools, uh, case studies, things we've created to support digital readiness and digital digitization projects. Um, it's a little too early in the morning for me to say the word digitization so many times, so <laughs> I apologize. Um, next slide, please. So what is building a digital readiness community of practice? Uh, this one year National Historical Publications and Records Commission funded project began in October 2020, which feels like a lifetime ago now. Uh, it builds on work completed through a 2019 planning grant, also funded by the NHPRC, uh, to support digital readiness in small and under-resourced local historical societies and historic preservation organizations across Wisconsin. Recollection Wisconsin and the Wisconsin Historical Society, along with Wills, uh, provide support for this community-driven venture, along with our launch committee comprised of librarians, archivists, and other local history practitioners who participated in our planning grant work. And for those of you unfamiliar with these organizations, Wills, or Wisconsin Library Services is a not-for-profit organization that provides cooperative purchasing, consulting, project management, and other services to libraries and cultural organizations across Wisconsin. Uh, Kristen Leffelman will be talking about the Wisconsin Historical Society's Local History Outreach Program, and Emily Fotenhauer will be talking about Recollection Wisconsin and the Digital Public Library of America or DPLA later this morning. So I'll save the detailed information for them to share. Um, but in short, with this project and this program, we're building a collaborative community-driven program to foster skills and infrastructure necessary to build confidence and competence in digital work and help Wisconsin local history organizations grow and sustain their digital programs. And Kristen just shared the link to our project website in chat. Uh, so if you haven't taken if you haven't seen that uh, go ahead and take a look at it sometime uh, there are two key concepts uh, that provide the foundation and structure for our work a uh, digital readiness and community of practice and you'll hear us use these terms frequently today in and in many of the resources we've created as part of this project uh, so first digital readiness there are quite a few definitions floating around for digital readiness but for our project, we define digital readiness as broadly, digital readiness broadly as having knowledge, tools, resources, and infrastructure to provide online public access to historical records. So pretty basic. Our second definition, uh, as described in the book, Cultivating Communities of Practice, uh, a community of practice is a group of people who share a common concern, set of problems, or passion about a topic, and they deepen their knowledge and expertise in this area by interacting on an ongoing basis. And we've drawn inspiration from this definition and some of the principles outlined in their work. Many of you are likely already participating in communities of practice as part of your work or your extracurricular or philanthropic activities. And we're excited to draw on our existing relationships and networks to connect folks who share an interest in and experience doing digital projects. That's our passion. And we hope through our year long project and beyond to expand this community to include folks who may be new to digital projects work, uh, maybe inherited a digital project from a predecessor, uh, all along the spectrum. All are welcome. So we have a bunch of information about our project uh, on our website, including the grant proposal narrative, if you want to dig into the details. But in short, we have two key project goals and outcomes. First, to increase preservation of and access to historic materials through a set of systematic approaches 
by providing resources to attain those goals. And second, to provide resources and support through a statewide community of practice where participants can share best practices, experiences, and learn from each other. And the learning from each other part is really important to us. So I'm excited that that's already happening this morning, sharing some, some suggestions and good ideas. Some additional benefits and project outcomes include systems and procedures to guide digitization efforts and help organizations stay consistent in their work, increased opportunities for engagement with staff and volunteers, conversations with and connections to other organizations who are doing digital work, and an ability to confidently pursue digitization projects that support things like reference, exhibitions, programming, and digital storytelling. And Kristen's going to talk a little bit more about these outcomes in a moment. So why this project and why now? Uh, since 2005, Recollection Wisconsin has been working with Wisconsin local history organizations to help folks digitize and share their historic resources in our platform, also called Recollection Wisconsin, which serves as our state's DPLA hub, Digital Public Library of America hub. Uh, through these relationships and digital projects work, we realized that folks needed more or different degrees of support than simply sharing scanning specifications or metadata standards. We recognized that local history practitioners needed more support throughout their digital projects life cycle. So from project planning to digital preservation and every step in between. There are more learning opportunities needed to support work all along the digital project spectrum, which led to the development of this project and the resources and community that we're creating as part of it. It's important to note that our goals and activities are community driven based on informal and formal information gathered over many years, but also through more recent information gathered during our 2019 planning grant from web surveys, community conversations, and strategic planning sessions with local history practitioners around the state. And some of you may have participated in some of that information gathering work, so we thank you very much for that. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, in fall 2019, we surveyed over 400 local history organizations about their digital readiness needs, and we received approximately 120 responses from practitioners and organizations around the state of Wisconsin. We then facilitated five community conversations around the state and probed deeper into some of the key themes and topics that came out of the survey results. And finally, in the fall of 2019, we convened three strategic planning sessions to further distill the results of our information gathering. This resulted in a strategic plan and laid the foundation for our implementation grant, our goals and activities, which resulted in this project building a digital readiness community of practice, and also this digital readiness fair today. Uh, so for those of you who are interested, we have a white paper that details all the information, um, our information gathering process, the results, uh, everything that we pulled together as part of the 2019 planning grant. And you can access this information on our project website. And Kristen just shared the URL with you. I'll emphasize again that at its core, this is a community-driven initiative. We asked local history practitioners throughout Wisconsin how best to support their digital readiness and digital projects work. And we responded with this project, building a digital readiness community of practice. So that's what this project is. Um, before we go on, I wanna give a quick shout out to folks who are currently serving as members of the Digital Readiness Launch Committee. Uh, a few of them are here with us today, including our host, Katie Stilp. Uh, and here they are at our first launch, uh, our first meeting in October 2020, our kickoff meeting. Um, this amazing group of individuals participated in all aspects of our planning grant uh, and then signed on to continue shepherding this effort. So we are so grateful for them. They represent local history organizations, museums, and public libraries around the state. They meet monthly uh, and provide guidance, review and help develop our learning resources, help plan events, and much, much more. Uh, they are our sounding board. They're our eyes and ears around the state and provide really valuable perspective from local history organizations, uh, their staff, volunteers, their patrons and community members, and their needs related to digital readiness. They are, in essence, the community of practice that we hope to continue growing and evolving over time. 
Uh, we're also extremely fortunate to have three other key project advisors. Uh, Wills and Recollection Wisconsin staff member Emily Fotenhauer and two staff members from the Wisconsin Historical Society's Local History Outreach Program, Janet Seymour and Kristen Leffelman. And you'll be hearing from a few of these folks later this morning. So before we move on, we have a quick question for you to ponder and perhaps share your thoughts in chat. Uh, I know we've asked you this before and we'll probably ask you this a few more times this morning but what digital readiness questions or needs do you or your organization have uh, feel free to throw your thoughts or your questions in chat now or whenever an idea occurs to you this morning and we're going to be collecting that information uh, and using that to inform some of our future programming and resources that we create so Without further ado, uh, I would like to pass the baton to Kristen Whitson. Kristen is the program assistant for the Digital Readiness Project, and she's going to tell you a bit more about some of the tools and resources that we've created as part of this project. So take it away, Kristen. Thanks, Vicki. It's so good to have everybody here today. Um, we're so excited to see many familiar faces and many new faces. So thank you so much for being here. Um, we're really excited to tell you about this project too. So I get the fun task of getting to show you all of the things that we have accomplished already and what we wanna continue doing with this project and how you all play into that. Um, so as Vicki said, I'm the um, program assistant for this digital readiness project. I'm here for the duration of the grant period to help implement the initiatives, tools, and resources that Wisconsin's cultural heritage community said that they needed in those surveys, conversations, and focus groups that Vicki um, just told you about. So I'm here to tell you a little bit about those uh, tools and resources today. Here's our um, our task for the next several minutes or our, our map for the next several minutes. I'm going to tell you about the digital readiness levels. Several of you helped us um, put those together. So I'm going to show you where we ended up with that. Um, the digital projects toolkit and implementation guide, which are something we're still working on. Uh, a digital readiness glossary, a series of digital readiness case studies, and then um, this summer's digital readiness fairs, which of course you know about because you're at our very first one, um, but we also have three more throughout the summer. So if today's events are beneficial to you and uh, you think you have colleagues or contacts who would benefit from them as well, um, we'll show you how to share the information for the next three fairs with others. So everything I'm gonna talk about is really the what and how of this project. Um, what Vicki shared is the why, as in why is this important and needed by the local history community. Um, and then here, uh, what I'm going to tell you is here are all the ways that Recollection Wisconsin and the NHPRC really as our funder have responded. Um, so I think the digital readiness levels are going to be linked in the chat here. Take a look at them. The digital readiness levels are based on something that some of you may have heard of and some of you may not have, which is okay, called the NDSA levels of preservation. Even if you've never heard of the NDSA or their levels of preservation, um, the digital readiness levels are designed and geared for a local history practitioner audience. Um, and we're going to look at an image of them too on my next slide. I just want to tell you that these levels of digital readiness are intended to be accessible, uh, non-consecutive ways of assessing and progressing through a set of guidelines. Um, so take a look at the levels in the chat if you want to look at them a bit more closely while I talk about them. This is what they look like. And as you can see, the levels are set up in seven different focus areas down the left side of the screen there. An organization can start, end, or progress anywhere in these levels of digital readiness. An organization may have a gold level plan in the plan and prioritize area, but may not have even considered sustainability or evaluation, and that's okay. That's exactly what these levels and this community of practice are here for. So Vicki and Emily, um, who you'll be hearing from later, we keep saying that because you're gonna hear from her later. 
uh, drafted the original version of these levels based on the feedback, questions, and concerns that they'd been hearing from digital projects partners over the years. The original draft version was submitted with the grant proposal, and then once the grant was funded, we undertook a community feedback and revision process to revisit and reimagine these levels. Um, we sent the levels and some questions to a network of about 70 different digital projects, experts, colleagues, and contacts, which includes several of you here today. So thank you very much. Um, if you hadn't already seen this, this is what all your hard work um, ended up uh, helping create. We also split our launch committee, the launch committee that Vicki had talked about, um, into work groups, and we had them focus on specifically a few of these functional areas each. Um, uh, let's see, soliciting and incorporating all of this feedback into the next version of the digital readiness levels was really essential to our community-driven community of practice model. It was really effective, I have to say. Um, we got some really important feedback about the structure, the language, and the accessibility of this foundational document, all of which we incorporated into the version that you see here. So if you've ever undertaken a digital project with which many of you have, as we were just talking about before we got started, you'll see that the functional areas um, or the focus areas here on the left side hew pretty closely to the actual experience of taking a project from beginning to end. And that's on purpose. The levels are intended to fit real life, everyday experiences of cultural heritage practitioners in small and under-resourced historical societies, which many of you are. And we're not done. Um, this is version 2.0, but it is certainly not the final or immutable version. We're going to continue collecting feedback um, throughout the grant period and beyond. And we envision this being a living document um, subject to changes and revisions to best fit the needs of the community of practice. And in fact, we'd even love to hear from you. Um, watch for our contact information and we're gonna have a form where you can sign up to join the community of practice. Um, and we'd love to hear from you in the future about uh, your thoughts on these digital readiness levels, how they work for you, if they don't work for you, your uh, feedback on them. The second page of this document includes um, these check as you go questions, which really emphasizes how recursive or repeating this process is. You do something, you check to make sure it's working you do a different thing and then you check to make sure it's documented or that if it worked, you, you wrote down why it worked that way. So as with the levels themselves, it seems to us, and we've heard from the community of practice, that these are questions that cultural heritage and local history practitioners really do ask themselves in part or in whole during the stages of the digital uh, projects. We gathered and collected these questions here to help those undertaking the digital projects to remember to ask all of these questions at every stage of the process. So of the many helpful things we heard from the, from the community of digital projects colleagues is that they needed both a place to start that didn't feel overwhelming. And I heard that from many of you in your registrations for today's event. Um, and you need specific tools to do the things you want to do in your digital projects. So as Vicki said, our community members need more than just metadata standards and scanner recommendations, but you also still need those recommendations. So we're in the process of combining existing Recollection Wisconsin instructional materials, which Vicki dropped a link to in the chat, um, with, we're in the process of combining those with digital readiness specific workflows, checklists, and guidelines. A lot of this material already exists uh, within Recollection Wisconsin's current iteration of this digital projects toolkit. Um, we're just adding, revising, and refining to include digital readiness specific resources. 
In keeping with our community-driven model, this whole package that I'm talking about will be workshopped and reviewed extensively by the community of practice and by our launch committee before being published by the end of the grant period. But you don't have to wait until then to visit the digital projects toolkit right now and make use of the resources and ideas that are available to you. Um, some of you may not have even known that Recollection Wisconsin had a digital projects toolkit. So if you're new to it, please visit and uh, let us know what you think. One of the tools that is already available that we've put together this year um, is the digital readiness glossary. And I'm just sort of a little nerdily excited about this one. Um, among the other feedback, we heard that archives and digital collections jargon and acronyms can feel really off-putting or overwhelming to community members. Um, one way to address that is to define the commonly used terms and acronyms in an easily accessible way. So we developed this glossary, again, in coordination with community of practice members and our launch committee. We borrowed, with credit, of course, uh, definitions from many well-known resources. And oftentimes we even rewrote those definitions in, in more plain language to make it even more um, easy to use. We put the glossary into an Airtable. If any of you use Airtable, you'll know what that is, and embedded it on our website. This setup will make it easy to update the glossary with suggestions and revisions, but it's also available to print in a PDF for those of you who would prefer a printed version. Um, this is another tool we'd really love to keep collecting feedback on. There's a link on that page to email us with um, suggestions, additions, or changes. Um, we'd love to hear your thoughts and uh, what else you think should be in the glossary. This glossary might be helpful for you in your own work, like maybe not even digital projects, maybe just like regular archives work or local history work. So please feel free to visit, give it a bookmark and consult it as often as you need to. Another tool that is available to you right now is a growing set of digital readiness case studies with local history organizations in Wisconsin. And several of you here in this call have participated in, in uh, the process of putting together case studies or your organization has been a feature of a case study. So thank you so much to those of you who have contributed in that way. The case studies have proven to be valuable resources that are really foundational to the way the community of practice is forming. So both the process of creating the case studies and the results of sharing those case studies have helped build community um, relationships and resources. Vicki and I have conducted interviews, sometimes multiple interviews, so thank you to those of you who are there for that, with cultural heritage organizations in Wisconsin who have undertaken various digital projects and have advice, lessons learned, and tips and tricks to share with the wider community. This is the case studies are one way that we're responding to the community's uh, request for real life practical advice from folks who have done the work. Conducting the interviews also gives us the opportunity to make connections between organizations who may not have the bird's eye view that we have um, at Recollection Wisconsin. And then sharing those interviews puts the organizations into a spotlight so that others can learn from their experiences. It works really nicely all the way around. So check out our case studies so far on the website that um, Vicki put into the chat. Let's see here. Finally, digital readiness fairs, which you know about because you are here. Um, this, these fairs are in many ways the culmination of what we have heard, learned, experienced, and taught. Um, there's three more fairs after this one today with different expert and practitioner sessions at each one. Um, and just to give you a really brief summary of what's coming up, at our next fair on July 16th, hosted by the Crandon Area Historical Society, the Forest History Association of Wisconsin, um, will share their experiences connecting with National History Day students for the use of their digital archives. And we'll hear from um, Bonnie Bird and the Waukesha County Historical Society, and Bonnie is here today, 
Um, we're going to hear from them about their use of the Clio.com, which is a digital history app. Hi, Bonnie. Did you turn your video on so you could wave? That's who's going to be one of our presenters at the next fair. <laughs> Um, on August 3rd, the Pioneer Village hosted fair, and I believe Tammy is here today, um, who's going to host that fair, uh, will feature a session on the first steps to digitization. And I think I saw some of those speakers with us today. There, that session will be um, for those uh, who are brand new to this process. Um, plus, there's going to be a session on very easy to follow guidance on copyright and permissions for digital projects. And then finally, on August 18th, the fair hosted by the Kenosha County Historical Society and Chris Allen, who's also here today, will include a session from the Jewish Museum of Milwaukee about their video oral history project. And then there's going to be another really unique session from the Dodge and Jefferson County Genealogical Society that will feature one of their youngest volunteers who's 17 years old and very excited about digitizing. So that'll be um, especially interesting for those of us who are trying to pull the younger generation of volunteers into our work. So if you find what we do here today to be helpful, and of course we hope you do, please consider passing along this information to your colleagues, anyone you think may be interested. Um, and as you noted with the weird recording announcement, we'll also be recording all of these sessions and we're going to be posting videos of the sessions on our website. So if you want to view these later or share the videos with colleagues, please do that. So we're going to pause here for questions and comments. I know we're towards the beginning of today's events. We're just getting started here. So we expect more questions and comments later. Um, but is there anything we can answer for you now? We have a pretty good chunk of time before our next session um, and we can use that for questions. We can use it for a slightly longer break or we can use it for chatting about digital projects. And feel free to put your questions in the chat or unmute and ask them out loud. What about uh, for digitizing uh, yearbooks? Um, have you worked any with, uh, was it OCI? I think it's, it's corrections, was it? Um, it's in a, Oklahoma. Yeah, in Oklahoma, yeah, Oklahoma corrections. Interesting. Any, any, I have not, but I have a feeling other people in this session have. Um, okay. Anybody who has worked on digitizing yearbooks, we'd love to hear from. Our library sent our yearbooks to them. And <clears throat> I wasn't really involved in the project, so I'm not exactly sure how it works. But if you go to their website, it's um, one of the things they do for um, training um, the prisoners is digitizing. And they do it at a, a lower price than what commercial companies would. I'm actually going to mention them later. Um, it, it might even be free for it, it, some Yeah, groups. it is free for certain years. I think it's right now they did 1950 through 1988, <laughs> I believe, yeah. or, or free. And then other years they would charge for. Yeah. Definitely something to look into. Yeah, and I, I, I don't looking. know if they digitize other things as well as yearbooks. Yeah, um, I was just wondering uh, on how good the results were. And I haven't looked at them. They got a disc back, or more than one disc, I guess, back. Um, but okay. I haven't looked at them. OK. Something that I know that we'd love to hear from you all on, and this can be something that you get back to us on too, but if you have an answer, feel free to jump in. You know, a big part of this project is forming these communities of practice, which means, you know, who's the person in the next local historical society or the next county over who you call when you have a question um, and how those um, networks and connections can be expanded into wider communities um, 
and how those communities are effective for you. So like, how do you communicate with those people and what's a good way to keep in touch with them? So does anybody have thoughts on how that works in your own um, work or volunteering? I can speak to that, I guess, because, uh, well, in Door County, we have what we call the Heritage Alliance of Door County, which is a very loose group that kind of gives a forum for our large number of historical organizations to uh, communicate and share ideas. Um, it is difficult uh, for a variety of reasons to kind of sustain momentum in these things. Um, most of the organizations involved are highly seasonal, uh, so it goes from very, very dormant in the winter to way too busy to do anything outside of core activities in the summer um, and we have kind of a, a, a narrow band of time in the spring and the fall when there's just kind of that perfect balance where we can begin to talk about shared projects and joint projects but that's historically been a big barrier to kind of doing more um, but we are we do have at least avenues of communication um, you know often you know just speaking Kind of you know in a, in a loose way i don't want to you know be be impolitic but I, there tends to be sometimes there's been tension between groups in the past as well um you know we have a lot of organizations in a small space here in door county and that's kind of inevitable that person with personalities and whatnot um and it just becomes a little bit difficult to balance that out at times um but we do find i mean we're with all that said um it's very important to have it and we're very glad to have it because you know at the when the time comes for a joint project when all the stars align we actually have kind of a mechanism to make that happen um and most counties don't have you know 13 14 historical societies to balance out either uh so that's it, a model that i think is has been successful for us and i think it's going to be successful for us in the future um it's something that you know it, it's probably the easiest lift is to just reach out to either your own county uh, and see who's out there within that space. Or if you have, you know, a, a collection of counties that have, you know, a certain mass of historical organizations forming some kind of just talking group, working group can often be really useful. Uh, so that's my two cents. Let me ask you a question, Steve. How do you all um, communicate or keep in touch with each other? Like, I know that's a pretty nitty gritty question, but do you have an email list served? Do you have a, um, a newsletter you send out to each other? How do you all keep in touch with each other? So right now we meet as an organization um, and that's the answer to your question has varied over the years. The organization has existed for about 15, 20 years now. And uh, that's, you know, it's been, it's, it's had widely varied um, approaches to that in that time. Um, in the past, uh, there would be monthly or bi-monthly like in-person meetings, actually. Uh, the idea being that everyone in the group could go around and see what everyone else was doing. So each organization would host it uh, and, and then move on, which I think was a great idea. Uh, our current iteration kind of fired up during COVID, so that wasn't possible. So now we meet over Zoom um, okay. when we can. Uh, and that's, that's sort of how we manage things. Got it. Thanks. In uh, 2019, a few people from this part of the state uh, wanted to get people from all the little uh, museums in this whole area together and do some sort of coordination. So <clears throat> we've kind of ended up calling it the Three Rivers um, History and it's Ocano, Marinette, Forest, uh, Florence and uh, Menominee, Michigan. I think that's all of us. And there's lots of little museums. None of us have resources to do a lot, but we thought we could at least like promote each other and, and like have a brochure that would tell about all of the different ones and maybe like have some sort of um, passport kind of thing where they're all listed and you go to all of them and you get them stamped and, you know, that sort of thing. So just to promote each other. On that topic of passes and stamps, um, I know something that our local library is doing. So the Historical uh, Museum and Archives is affiliated with this Door County Library. Um, we've just begun a project to offer museum passes to 
uh, visitors for checkout at the library. Um, we're working with the Maritime Museum, the Door County Maritime Museum as a kind of a pilot for the project and hopefully we'll be able to expand that to other not just history, but organizations in general around our county in the future. Uh, I know that Manitowoc is um, the Manitowoc, Manitowoc County Historical Society has a similar project that's been going for several years. Uh, the museum campus in Chicago has done it for many years. It's not a new idea, um, but there's been a huge amount of excitement for it uh, around here. So uh, library partnerships are great. We live in the same space as libraries. Um, you know, often we share goals, we share resources. Sometimes libraries are our meeting spots. Sometimes they host our collections. Uh, so that's a, a collaboration that I highly recommend if you haven't per, uh, tried for it. I'm sure your library would be very eager for something like that. Absolutely, and I know we have several libraries here today too. Um, and our host, Katie Stilp, is the local history librarian at the Appleton Public Library. So she knows all about that. <laughs> yeah, we have what we call Explore Fox Cities. Um, that's very similar, we have passes that you know, they're available kind of first come first serve. We put them out kind of random times throughout the month and people can come and, and take them. Um, they're for like shows at the Performing Arts Center um, to go see like the, uh, the art gallery in town or a performance at Lawrence University. We partner with a lot of different organizations throughout our Fox Cities area um, to provide those free passes. So it's a great opportunity to collaborate with your library and, and get the word out about all these different organizations around the state. And really some of this is um, closely related to or an outgrowth of the Wisconsin Historical Society's local history effort, as Janet just mentioned in the chat. Um, there are similar efforts going on throughout the state. So, um, you know, a big part of this project, so just to sort of wrap it up into a bow on the community of practice question, um, is that we really want to encourage you all to reach out to the neighbor, whoever the neighbor is, um, and, uh, and then more neighbors and form those connections that will be helpful for you and supportive um, f of your projects um, in those maybe rare times that you actually have time to connect with each other and, uh, and support each other's projects. Um, we got a great question in the chat from Nancy about suggestions on, and we'd love to hear from you too. So I should say that a big part of what we want to do today between sessions and during question and answer periods is that we, you know, Vicki, I, Emily might be able to answer some questions for you, but we want you to answer questions for each other too. So Nancy's question, any suggestions on recruiting community members to be involved in digitizing resources? And Jody, if you're here, I know you have some answers on this too, because we talked about it. Um, board members for the most part are older and not adept at technology. Um, some who are a little younger, who are still working. So how do we recruit folks to spearhead and be involved in digitizing resources? That's a great question, Nancy. Anybody have some thoughts on that? Or what's worked for your organization? I want to suggest you go call your local Girl Scout Council. They have <gasps> high school girls who can do this as a part of their gold award. They can do it just for service hours, but that's a good resource. Kids learn how to digitize things all the time. That's a great idea. And we have been delighted to see several people from Girl Scouts of America signed up for these digital readiness fairs. So we're so excited that you're here. Thank you. And we have questions about merit badges and how we can help partner with um, Girl Scouts who need uh, service hours in uh, local history settings. So we'd love to talk about that some more. <laughs> Good. We had um... We had connected with a group of model railroad enthusiasts, and they were very eager to get at our photographs of uh, railroads, it depots, uh, anything related to railroads. And we got <clears throat> our sort of collection of railroad memorabilia and pictures and documents digitized through their efforts. We also learned about a lot about the contents of these photographs that we would have never achieved without uh, without their knowledge. We don't have a Girl Scout program much here, especially older, but um, the National Honor Society 
students also need uh, volunteer hours. So that might be something, I don't know if, if you could get one interested and then they continue on past the hours that they really need, but that's a possibility. I think there's a broader kind of thing coming out here about selling digitization. I think we often think of it as being a very, very unattractive thing to do and hard to sell to people because it's you know it's tedious and so forth but uh you know what we found is that it's it's very appealing to certain people and it, it can be extremely appealing to interested people in a way that you would never expect or to demographics that you would never expect we had a high school volunteer who actually approached us uh completely on her own initiative to produce digital content for us during the pandemic um, which, you know, highlighted for us that we were not tapping into a demographic that we needed to be tapping into, but also that, you know, our assumptions about what is cool and uncool or what, how, how we relate to, to, you know, younger people or people that you wouldn't consider to be a, a standard volunteer base were totally wrong. Um, and for people like the model train enthusiasts who are you know, passionate about history already, there's very few ways to engage with history more intensely than to do bulk digitization because you get to just spend hours and hours just engaging with historical materials in a really focused way. And for, you know, for the hard cases like us, that's actually really delightful and not dull at all um, and can be a really transcending experience. So I think that is an experience you can sell to a lot of different constituencies. Absolutely. And I know that one of the case studies we did on Chippewa Valley Museum, um, the archivist there talked about that um, sometimes it might be tempting for us to dismiss um, older volunteers as not tech savvy, um, but that that is not necessarily the case. And this goes back to part of the digital readiness levels is about writing, uh, documenting your process, writing really clear instructions can make it really easy for any volunteer to follow a digitization workflow um, and, and again, banishes assumptions about what we think about demographics of uh, volunteers um, and where to find them and what they might be interested in and what they might like to do. So does that, Nancy, that was a lot of conversation about your question. Did that help answer any of what you were looking for? <laughs> Yes, it it really did. And it gave me some ideas. And um, I think I like to connect with our schools. I know we connected with them on our recent Native American exhibit um, that we did at the um, museum. And they seem to be excited about that. So maybe we can get them excited about this too. So thank you for all the suggestions. Absolutely. And it looks like um, we are going to take a break because we went a little bit past the break period. So if we want to um, turn off our cameras and turn off our microphones, and why don't we come back um, in five minutes? So at 9.52, quick break if we need it. See you in a minute. 